Hey, 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 you are back on the Virtually Agile podcast with Chris Stone, the Virtual Agile Coach. In this episode, I'm joined by a fellow Agile Coach and Scrum Master who helps his clients to increase productivity by up to 65%. Welcome to the show, Andre. How's it going? Hi, Chris. It's my pleasure to be with you and talking to you on this podcast. I'm doing fine. It's a wonderful day here in Stockholm where I'm based in Sweden. Amazing. I've not been to, to Sweden for a few years now. I remember going to a, a great ice bar and a, a Viking restaurant where they announced your arrival as you went down the stairs. It was so much fun. They basically blew a horn and said, right, this is Chris Stone. And, and, and I, I can't remember who, who I was with, but we then climbed up on the tables, uh, over the tables. Sorry, it was just so much fun. Have you been there? Yeah, I've been there. It's a working restaurant in Old Town, Gamastown, and um, every host going there is welcome um, by the workers over there. It's an amazing place, and it's a very crowded place sometimes as well. Gamblerstan, that's the one. Yes. Now, Andre, uh, there are people here that aren't familiar with you. Uh, you work with some very interesting companies, so tell us about your your background with Agile, a bit about your journey. Yes, so first I will share my story as I became a Scrum Master and later also Agile Coach. So I used to be the IT guy and known as a IT Administrator, IT Support Engineer, uh, working with IT departments and helping um, solving a lot of problems in the cloud and IT infrastructure as well. Lately, I started my own company where I wanted to introduce some uh, smart IoT product for business travel. So, uh, so we did our MVP and also um, we get some interest from investors and others people so we get some traction and we use the lean, which is very known as one of the frameworks from HI. And we scale a bit more and more more people come our teams and we also wanted to kind of have something more productive so we jumped into trello use the new canva and later scrum later in also in stockholm i was introduced to flow by andrew kalman so i spent some time on his uh, meetups and i find out more about scrum and that was my first kind of touch upon uh, on Scrum framework. Uh, lately, I also became a, a Scrum master for one of the international companies in Stockholm, uh, working with software development. And then I was uh, spent some years there and lately also changed a bit the companies where I was working with designers, really more visual based. <laughs> Uh, mindset and individuals, very talented people. And lately also in manufacturing, but this time in the UX uh, department. This is a short um, story about me and now I'm becoming an um, agile coach. I'm also providing some values uh, for our community in Milo, in Miloverse, where I have some templates for a retrospective. I like to create something valuable for Scrum Master, so they can use a uh, retrospective in a better way and more creative. It will be fun. Outstanding. So you've you've come from a, a tech background. You've had a bit of entrepreneurial experience creating products. You've uh, worked in roles such as Agile Coaching and, and, and Scrum Mastery, involved with uh, uh, meetups, and you've begun creating, a bit like me, being a bit of a creator, creating different ways of, of people doing things like retrospectives. So you can catch some of our Andre's work on Miroverse. Absolutely. Yeah. Search for my name and you will find it on seven um, retrospective. Amazing. So uh, you've got some interesting experiences there. What were some of the perhaps key lessons that, that stood out to you? What, what could our, our listeners learn from, from your experience across all of those different things? Well, there are a few things uh, I can say, like creating retrospective for the team or even department is very really enjoyable because it gives me kind of spikes, like what problems are not addressed and I can form questions, right, for the retrospective. And these questions I can, um, you know, um, connect to some characters, right? 
so for example, one of the favorite retrospective and my words from my side is a uh, dog retrospective when I reflected some questions to each uh, dog, you know, and it's very enjoyable. It's one of the most downloaded retrospective uh, um, from my side. Uh, so it's amazing. And also lately I created a retrospective uh, which is connected to kind of coffee. So each uh, coffee have different flavor and different flavor might have different, you know, meaning. And like, it's amazing. It's just there over three weeks and it got, you know, uh, over a hundred downloads so fast. It's amazing. And also because like you can use this template, the coffee retrospective like uh, in my role, but if the team is uh, collocated in one office, you can also bring the, the coffee with you, you know, and each um, team member can have different coffee and you can connect with, with the questions, right? So it's, I wanted to bring me a little bit more kind of a connection, something what you like and you may be consuming every day or a few times a day. And that's how um, this idea came up with the coffee retrospective. So you've chosen, and then this is something that I do very heavily when I, when I create retrospectives as well. You've chosen themes uh, that resonate with people from, from dogs to you know, how many people are dog lovers out there to coffee, how many of us are fueled by coffee on a day to day basis. And you can use those themes that people resonate with that they, that they enjoy and bring them into the way we work, but still with a purpose. You're still using them to uh, inspire creative thinking or to get people to think of things in perhaps ways they haven't thought before. So using your example with, with coffee, obviously there's so many different flavors of coffee. You've got, you've got lattes, you've got chocolate flavored ones, you've got, you've got the nth degree, there are so many different types. And you could use some, some logic or related to the, the types of coffee to ask a question in a certain way. And perhaps, Andre, you want to give one of those, those examples there. Perhaps uh, chuck out one of your coffee-based questions. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Uh, I have a few of them and uh, could give you just a, a few examples. And we have like the Irish coffee, like, have you ever risk of the bold moves paying off like whiskey kicking in the Irish coffee. This is about the Irish coffee. And then we have another one, for example, latte, who of what do we appreciate with the team, like the comforting and supportive uh, presence of steaming milk in latte. So we're, we're evoking feeling and not just, uh, not just thought, because if you've had a, an Irish coffee or a, a latte, you can immediately think, well, the idea of whiskey being coffee is quite bold. And, and therefore, how can we use that same logic? How can we be bold in the way we work going forwards? Or what's, what's comforting to us, like the, like the, the, the hot milk, hot creamy, milk. foamy, foamy is the word I was looking for, the hot foamy milk that you get in a latte. And what comforts us about how we work or what, what, what do we enjoy about how we work? So we can, we can use these, these themes, these questions to get people thinking a bit differently. And again, it doesn't have to be a boring, repetitive experience. So yeah, interesting creations. Thank you for sharing. Before we, before we delve into creating a brand new retro of our own, I'd love to hear, where did that 65% number come from? You, you mentioned helping teams, or helping clients achieve an increase in productivity of up to 65%. What was the, what was the driver behind that? Uh, it was realizing um, uh, some obstacles in the uh, project and removing these obstacles and also bring uh, better communication between uh, scrum teams and also departments. And it was also a big achievement and also uh, removing a lot of like, uh, you know, tools which we don't need, you know, a lot of procedures and this was really kind of blocked because they spent so much time in documenting uh, every single you know release and this kind of things and um, there are a few you know small things which might reflect and uh, you know in, in better improvement um, so there was a few of these uh, small things that make a big difference and also like uh, me as a form of scrum master over there I took a bit more initiative and um, 
talk outside of Scrum team and also implementing some new processes in the in the project, which also reflected in better and faster delivery. I love the focus there on removing and not adding. So you can get a huge amount of productivity or, or increased value by removing things from what you're doing rather than adding new things to it. So uh, there's a great retrospective I've created called the, the Eight Lean Wastes Retrospective. It's based upon the uh, the book by Mary and Tom Poppendick uh, that was obviously a, a reference to the original lean Toyota manufacturing processes. And in that retro, you get people thinking about the the wastes in software engineering and how they apply to your team. So where are the where are the handoffs uh, or where are the where is the too many defects and where is the unnecessary features and things like that and it gets you thinking about which of these impact us most as a team and then you use further questions to prompt how they could identify improvements to those areas that sounds like a very good connection like bring this value from agile and reflect them in a retrospective it's amazing how how you know creative we can be as a scrum masters uh, and using this, you know, a retrospective. And each time we run a retrospective, you know, we see how we can maybe tweak these questions or change the character to make it even better. Good stuff. Right. So let's do something that we've never done before on the podcast. We're going to create a brand new retrospective on the fly. We're going to leverage the collective skills of Andre and I to do so. And we're going to do so on a completely random topic so if you've got anything that you're you're keen to create one on otherwise i can always dip into my huge backlog let's find something from your backlog now why don't we do a retrospective based on the five scrum values i think that's been on my backlog for a while and i haven't done that one yet what do you think that sounds like a good idea hmm, let's find out these five values openness one uh, you've got uh, respect and courage. Yes. Focus. Uh, focus, yeah, and commitment, commitment, right? Commitment, right. So let's, yeah, let's try and create one based on that. So if we imagine each of those were your five prompts. So we've got things like how could be, I've got a, a retro based on the five dysfunctions of a team. And in, in that, obviously, um, lack of commitment is one of the dysfunctions. So this could be around how are we, uh, how are we enabling the team to commit to our work or where where do we need to enable us to be able to commit to our work or commit to our goals or commit to our priorities or something to that effect or commit to deliver our increment smoothly mm. i think we could probably approach this one of two ways we could either assume that there is a problem or we could start with a blank slate and say where are we struggling with commitments and then try and find that or we could we could flip it around and say how are we enabling ourselves to commit and just see what comes out so there's probably two ways of approaching that isn't there kind of starting with the positive and starting with the negative yeah i think we can start with the positive that sounds like good to me okay and then similarly with focus you could ask you know, how are we enabling ourselves to, to focus or where could we enable ourselves to focus more? Or how we can concentrate, uh, right, to get the focus and sh deliver. Mm. And this, this to me leads into helping teams discover or improve their um, or, or limit their work in progress, right? So keeping things simple, having fewer priorities, completing those well before moving on. Absolutely. And then it's making it much easier for them to find out and stick on the focus, right? Yeah. We've got uh, openness. So this is all around, I guess, transparency yes. uh, and open communication. Uh, so I, th I think many of these questions, they, they, they could start with uh, the how or where are we demonstrating this value? The openness might be how we can uh, communicate comfortable and uh, we, uh, you know, safe and in, in, in safe environment. Mm, leading into psychological safety. So I think as my as I'm talking through this with you, I think it would be great to, if what I'm imagining on a on a, on a mirror board or whatever platform you're using, kind of templated. You've got each of the five values, and the first part is 
how are we demonstrating these currently? All right, so how are we demonstrating the scrum values currently? And then the next prompt could be, how could we further demonstrate these values or what, what's missing from this value or what's holding us back from demonstrating this scrum value? Or what we can improve to get closer to this uh, scrum value also. Mm. You could even also have some sort of a uh, voting mechanism. I'm al almost imagining a bit of a, a radar where you get an anonymous vote and you've got to read each of these values on a pentagon. Imagine kind of a radar visual and you get a, a one to 10 rating from each individual. How much are we demonstrating these values? And then if one of these is lower than others, and you've got a, you know, that, that might be an area of focus, you could narrow into that and say, right, how could we enable ourselves to demonstrate that further? Because clearly, as the data is telling us, that seems to be our weaker area. Absolutely, and it's also important to focus on the weaker area so the team can be more deliverable, you know, and also more and stronger, actually. Yeah, improving on our weaknesses is a great way to improve the team. So, yeah, I think I think we probably have got the bare bones of a, a retrospective there. It, it may begin with a bit of an anonymous vote that enables people to share how much, in their view, these scrum values are being exhibited by the team on a 1 to 10 rating. And, and the output of that could be a bit of a radar style visual, which will narrow into your, your weaker points. And then you could then go into prompts that will help the team identify how they could improve upon those those values further. What's holding them back from exhibiting that value further? What's getting in the way of that? Or just open open ideation. How could we demonstrate this value more in the way we work as a team? Or we can also identify the obstacle, how we can remove the obstacle to move faster. It's also a good way to address it. Sounds good, right? So what we'll do is after this, we'll create this, uh, create this as a retro uh, and share it with others. That would be great. Awesome. All right, so a new retro for you folks. Let's talk about motivating teams. I know this was a, a topic that you were keen on. Why do you believe motivating teams is important, Andre? I think that when teams are, you know, occupied with a lot of things and tasks in Jira, there's a lot of expectation from management, it's hard to, you know, uh, as individual in the team and uh, find motivation to do something because it's easy to be lost uh, with some task, but motivate and have more energy. And also these days we working some days in the office, some days at home, it's difficult to change environment and we have a lot of influence, a lot of expectation and the motivate t team is important to bring uh, more clarity and focus to have open communication which also reflects in um, better collaboration so from your perspective uh, teams that are motivated will communicate better they'll work with together better there'll be improved collaboration and ultimately all of these things lead to uh, i guess a better product or service for the for the clients or the customers of that of that team Absolutely. I have experience of working in multiple projects uh, when I was as a scrum master in the past. And I see like uh, when um, COVID hit and later we came to the office, it was quite difficult to work with new tools, you know, uh, Miro and a few others. It was a lot of expectation. There was a lot of delay. So we, we need to really prioritize how we can improve the communication, have less uh, meetings because if we are located in different countries, different time zones, it, it might be an also obstacle, right? So we find out like we can have daily scrum in the in one time where all we connect together, even in the different time zones. So one thing might start sooner, one later, and we connect together. So that's improve the daily sync, right? And also um, some of us, we can be in the office and we can have video conference uh, for the daily scrum. We can use also like the Miro board. So, and also recently I created also another template for a daily scrum. The, one of the problem was like, 
product owner show up and was mostly like, oh, this is a Jira board, right? Let's see what we have accomplished. But like the PO always asks, oh, Jenny, what have you accomplished? John, you know, and sometimes I felt like, well, I was sick and was dependency from other teams. There is nothing new. And later I find out in one-to-one -one, uh, coaching for them was like a status meeting. So I changed it. And also quite recently in 2020 in the Scrum Guide, we kind of replaced these standard questions and the daily Scrum, you know, come up with a better solution and the commitment to the screen goal, like create templates. And in the middle is like, what's stopping us or preventing us to deliver the screen goal. So one person, uh, answer and then can give the ball to the other person, you know, and they can answer from their perspective and also open question or something related to spring goal. And I am from that time, I see the team deliver more, you know, uh, in the sprint and removing more obstacles that address it during the daily scrum more frequently. It's kind of more gamification for them as well, because once the one team, one member of the team finish or answer the, the question, the commitment to a spring goal can ask the other team member and he can choose. And once um, they finish, um, we know what is the focus for the day or we remove the obstacles and uh, it's much more better way how we can make uh, have a daily scrum in company. So you alluded to uh, a number of different techniques by the sounds of it that you subscribe to, to to help motivate teams. If I was to call out some of the ones that I heard, there was examples of uh, mixing up the way you do daily scrums as an example. So mm -hmm. not just doing it the same way over and over oh, repetitively. Okay. You've got using gamification techniques to make it more enjoyable uh, because we know uh, agile is fantastic for introducing kind of a, a rhythm uh, a, a set way of working but well, a set way of working but a bit of a cadence uh, a continued series of meetings that you know what's going to ha be happening in each of those but as a consequence of that sometimes it can make those repetitive so by mixing things up adding a bit of creativity we can inspire and motivate another thing i i heard you say there which i i, I really want to highlight is that when you've got meetings that feel like status reports, right? especially daily scrums, when they're just the standard three questions from the past, which we know have been updated now, it can feel very much like someone, a, a person is being called out and saying, hey, where are you at with that? So how, what have you achieved since yesterday? And I love to flip the, the dialogue there towards what have we achieved? Not you, what have we achieved since yesterday? How are we going to achieve our goal today? How can we help each other achieve our goal today? What's stopping us? And that simple language change can be far more motivating because it feels like otherwise you're being called out, you know, you're being held accountable for a result, which sometimes may be somewhat arbitrary, but, but by focusing more on, a, on the team, that can be far more motivating in my experience. Absolutely, I like, could change few things in you know in the questions and like it's an individual focus of uh, of the team because we cooperate together to deliver the increment right, which is also other way how we can address this, which is also more enjoyable and also motivate as a group of people scrum team to uh, also collaborate together during the daily scrum, which is great. And yeah, coming back to that, that those scrum values, you know, it's uh, having having that team commitment. Where we are we are working on this to deliver an increment of value to our customers. And if we can create a great environment where people have the courage to challenge each other around, are we are we achieving our our increment? Then then even better, I think. So I'm interested, do you have any examples or telltale signs of low morale or motivation that you've experienced uh, in your work and how have you addressed those? Yes, sure. I had uh, some team where was a culture difference from a different country. And that time um, we spent a lot of time in the meetings and there was not time for knowing each other more. And when a new team member came, I also introduced the new team member in the scrum team, but also I 
uh, had kind of a kind of together like a s session where we know each other from the personal side like we shared our values of our uh, like me andre and also other like product owner and uh, other team members of the scrum team uh, and we also share oh in my free time i like to ski in my free time i like to explore and cooking a uh, new food from different country and i remember uh, after a few weeks um uh, we also meet together and some members flew from Germany to Sweden, to Stockholm. And recently, at uh, that time, was some um, culture week. So we meet in Konstagården and we make um, some walk around and we were able to taste different food from different country. And this also bring kind of, a, you know, we discover like, oh, that person like, um, you know, Swedish cinnamon roll, the other person like a uh, brandwurst uh, from a uh, hot dog, basically from, you know, Germany, which is very common and this kind of thing. So next time when we were in the office environment and they flew back to Germany, we were talking about, oh, I make a great uh, cinnamon roll at I'm home. I got the recipe and this kind of things. It's also on real lot of hidden things you know in, in the team open communication improved collaboration and like, more deep team commitment and find out what we like in private life also you know improve the communication in in the in the office in the working time environment so uh what you've told us there is examples of how focusing on the human side of of work you know the person behind the keyboard the person behind the screen that we often see people in these days uh, can be a great way to to motivate we learn about their culture we we form better connections with them we feel like we're part of a team rather than working with strangers absolutely we know each other more and we we discover more about new team member and also the new team member learn about other team members so the new person is quite welcome in, in, in the team, you know, because like when your employee is starting, let's say it's everything it's known f new for the person, right? And to uncover the kind of personal barrier so we can communicate together, it's more also beneficial for, for the new employee, you know, the new sc sc team member in the scrum team. So it's kind of more welcoming and I wanted to um, open this environment for every team member to knowing each other more mm. that's a great way to welcome a new team uh, i've used examples like uh, using a manual of me type exercise where you share who you are and what you're about and what your preferences are and a little bit of big detail about your your personal life if you're comfortable doing so i think you alluded to there around uh, almost like team chartering and sharing values and how we want to work together that can also be a great technique to uh, at least start with uh, getting the, a, a right, good, high-performing team. And that leads us into our, our next section, our next question. High performance is often this, this buzzword term that's thrown around when we talk about teams. What does, what does high performance mean to you? And have you got any examples of teams you've worked with that have been high-performing? So a uh, high-performing team is for me is a team where um, they collaborate together, they have open communication, they are able to find a solution for the obstacle or, or problem, even outside of um, their scrum team, I mean, of the department, they're open to communicate with stakeholders. And that's very important uh, for, the, you know, uh, be a high performing team uh, in a in company where we use scrum or agile. The other aspects like psychological safety, so we are able to express ourselves without judgment from others. And um, sometimes, the, many times, the psychological safety is kind of the base. And then we can, you know, build on top of it. Uh, the communication its you know, the kind of the open doors to, to get the high performing team um, really uh, performing well, right? removing obstacles as mentioned before and it's not all the time about the team it's also all the scrum master to help the scrum team 
you know, to protect the team from other, uh, maybe managers, you know, who wants to get something done even faster, you know, or, you know, the sprint is open. Maybe sometimes they have to wait, you know, a few sprints to get something done and this kind of things. It's, I see the Royal Scrum Master is very crucial for the team to make it even more efficient. And the Royal Scrum Master is also like coach the uh, team members, right? And also uncover the best potential in form of coaching, in form of uh, training sometimes. And, uh, and also the product owner should be supportive uh, for the um, um, scrum team members so they can uh, get support from him and also sometimes the product owner can unlock a lot of other things which is not possible from the uh, no for example developer and others all right so you touched on a few really important things there some topics that often come up on this podcast we've we've talked about uh, psychological safety hugely important uh, we, we were talking about this recently with a, a recent guest, Duena Blomstrom, around psychological safety and the presence of it in teams was noted to be the, the, the most critical indicator of high performance, the presence of psychological safety as part of the Google Aristotle project. You alluded to, as you were talking there, to some of the, the values being demonstrated, you know, having the ability to communicate openly uh, and collaborate without fear of... Uh, judgment or, or failure to make mistakes. So that was all good stuff too. Now, do you have a story that you can share with us about how you've been able to help a, t a specific team with addressing uh, motivation, either improving it or otherwise? Yes, I have um, a few examples. We have a team of uh, very creative people and they like to uh, create a new stuff, right? They like to try new things. They a little bit, you know, lacking of discipline sometimes, but that's the different way of working of it because they're more creative, like they're more playful. Um, we were in big uh, departments, over 10,000 people, and they saw some um, achievement from other team where they're able to work on some idea and also later implement in, in production in, in the business. And they were quite jealous from our sister team because they were able to have kind of hackathon where they spend like four or five days working on some idea and then implement in the business. And our team, they never had the opportunity to, to have uh, the time, right? Uh, spend the four or five days working on some idea and implement. And like I saw some initiative from the some members of the team, they wanted to do it, but they were a bit, you know, hesitant to ask the product owner. And I say like, hmm, I think they really, uh, you know, need this. And I talk to the product owner and say, I see there is a request from a need from the team, you know, to have this hackathon uh, and then later we come to open discussion where they were able to discuss and the product owner prioritized uh, some days for this hackathon and it was amazing because after this hackathon we have some uh, conference where other departments also demonstrated what they did and also other scrum teams during the hackathon it was amazing and um, it was much more motivated and also later, you know, a very common and that time was last year, this kind of meta thing from Facebook and others. So some part of it actually was able to be part of meta where it was kind of more virtual environment, uh, kind of, and they were able to get the product, new experience for the, for the users, basically, which was very beneficial. I can, and, I can say and like sometimes these team members have the hard time to speak out from the product owners because some of them were from different culture more quiet you know they might think oh I might be charged and I think to make this uh, 
environment where you're not judged from others and you can speak out is very important, which is, is as well part of this psychological safety, which we touch upon um, today. Excellent. That's a great story of how you've leveraged a, a technique which I don't think is used often enough or an approach that's not often used is the hackathon. And what I love about hackathons, they're not just for tech teams. They can be used in, in any industry. I've heard of them being used to, to build new toys, new, new games. Like Hasbro famously created hundreds of new game concepts in a matter of days, something that would have taken them millions, of, uh, millions in expenditure and, and cost to, to do so. And all that was, was creating the space for unfiltered, unfettered creativity. Now, you can do this with teams by just saying, right, in this time period, this, this day, whatever, or, or two days, or whatever you're able to secure uh, in terms of uh, capacity from often product ownership and, and leadership, in this time period, you can work on whatever you like. Those things that never make it to the backlog that you'd love to work on. Fixing those bugs that never make it high enough on the priority list, but it's always been a problem for you. And by the way, I've got a great story about that. I, I heard a story once about a guy who joined a company as a developer. He fixed a bug that had been bugging him forever about a product that he used, and then he left immediately. And that's all he did. He wanted that bug resolved because he loved this product so much, and then he quit. And I thought that was hilarious, right? But this is the, this is the thing. These, these, uh, these hackathons, they provide you that opportunity to work on something that inspires you, that, that you would really enjoy creating or working on. And it can also uh, result in new relationships being built because you end up working with people outside of your usual team. It can result in things that would never have made it into a product actually making it to a product. And there are some really famous real life examples of how hackathons have resulted in great success. Amazon's buy it now button was the product of a hackathon. I believe the the like button and um, the like button on Facebook and the... Uh, the alert to say that you are safe from a natural disaster came from a hackathon as well. And often these, these things, this time isn't afforded to teams, developers, because they're constantly working on the next priority, prioritized list from the backlog. Uh, I know Scaled Agile includes their, their IP sprints, every program increment. So once every quarter, roughly, for most companies, they get to work on some stuff that, that, that really interests them that isn't on the backlog. But I definitely think uh, companies, teams could benefit from using hackathons more, from providing that autonomy for, for teams to work on something that's cool, something that inspires and motivates them. And the boost in energy afterwards has been great. I've done this myself. They can sometimes be completely unfiltered, as in work on whatever you like, but you can also set people this, this challenge, this problem. How could we delight our customer in this hackathon? How could we reduce waste in this next hackathon? How could we improve how we work as a team in this next hackathon? You could do it as part of a retrospective exercise. So it's a really great technique. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. You're welcome. I think, like, as you mentioned, like uh, companies implementing, implementing more of this kind of hackathon or innovation week sometimes. I, I think it's very beneficial, especially for people who are creative, to like to try something, you know, have the space, you know, to spend a few days and build something new and which can be also part of the business project or the product, uh, you know, it's even beneficial for the company and also open eyes, you know, for a lot of management. Oh, we achieve a lot of things and we discover something new, which can be part of our future delivery service product whatsoever and also having this time for creating something new during the hackathon yeah that happens like four times a, um, a year right or every third month but also like having the time in, during the spring not just to work on our stories and tasks which are in Chira, but also dedicate the time during the spring to work on something like you know, we can have output from the retrospective. We want to improve communication, dedicate the time during the spring to work on the communication, which you find out from the retrospective. Sometimes even make like a story work on improvement, which is connected to communication. If you don't uh, make a space for this, you never improve. And as a Kaizen, which is 
connected to agile continuous improvement we want to improve but we also have to dedicate time for the improvement in the sprint I completely agree. Uh, I often see teams do their retrospectives and they identify a long list of things. And then those things, they just disappear into the ether. They don't become part of the backlog. They're not prioritized. They're, they're side of desk efforts. And therefore they, they often get done last or not at all. And then they carry over from sprint to sprint. And then the team is frustrated because nothing changes or they're, they're, they're raising the same problems at a retrospective over and over. So you're very right to highlight that these things, these improvements, they need capacity. They need to be factored into the backlog for the next sprint alongside the other work to be done. Otherwise, you know, out of sight, out of mind. There's a, there's a quick story I'd love to share from my own experience around improving morale. I was once working with a company that had uh, 13 different teams running in, running, run, working on a very large program and it was very distributed all across the globe and there was problems with morale because they had uh, committed to a, this, this program years in advance without input from the, the people building the stuff as to whether it's achievable. And the morale was very low and it was tangible. You could notice it, you could, you could feel it in every meeting, every town hall, the energy was really low, people weren't feeling it. So I wasn't just trying to improve the, the motivation at a team level, I was trying to help the wider company. And a very simple change that I introduced was just talking about recognition, you know, celebrating achievements incrementally rather than just once a year where you put in a form and say, hey, nominate the person that's done really well this year. What I did is every Friday I began just writing down, uh, I called it Kudos Friday, I called it an experiment. So I said, we're going to try something here. Every Friday I began just recognizing a few people that have done some great work in that week and I encouraged others to do the same. I remember that first Friday I did it, several people responded. The, the week after the Friday came and again I did it and, and more people took part this time. The third week, before I'd even logged in, someone had kicked it off. So it was starting to, to, to take effect. It was starting to, to, to have impact and people were enjoying it. They were, they were liking the fact that they were getting recognition because that can be huge for, for motivation as well. And it began to start to create this culture of recognizing the great work of others. And that was a very simple thing you can do. All you need to do is just introduce it as an experiment, perhaps in a Slack channel, whatever your top, your comms channel is, and say, hey, I'm gonna take some time today to recognize some great work that people have done. Uh, absolutely, it's a good idea to uh, celebrate something. Also, when you celebrate something, you can have kind of achievement board, celebration board, so that people can see what they achieve and when achieve. And, like, Friday they can celebrate together maybe every second week I mean this also motivates people right oh we achieved this goal oh next time I don't know the release might be out there faster right oh we have some holidays let's make something fun you know go together to restaurant and some you know networking there know each other there it's not about all the time be in the office it also be outside and trying different environment which also open more space for you know uncover what we don't know now maybe learn something new and you know it's always good and also like be as scrum masters and agile coaches we have a lot of heads right but also maybe sometimes good to facilitate at some workshops to find out if oh, that's the problem can we find out what can be the solution for the, you know uh, for the problems and um, you know for um, questions in the Miro or we can have a whiteboard with sticking bring the team together and we can um, facilitate and, and make um, better you know improvement uh, together with uh, um, our team members and better in the future but the implementation of this and um, from the problem we have a solution which can be implemented it's also great it helps a lot it does indeed now uh andre where can our listeners learn more about you and your work sure there are a few resources they can find me on linkedin so search andre papanek or go to the page itmanagement.consulting and lastly, um, if you want to find my retrospective, go to Myroverse, search for my name, Andre Papanek, and all templates are there. 
I will include a few links when we when the, the episode goes out for those of you that, like me, were struggling to spell Andre's full name. Now, uh, thank you for joining us on the show today, for creating a new retrospective with me and giving us some food for thought about motivating teams. We are always looking for new guests to join us on the Virtual Agile podcast, so if you'd like to be like Andre and get involved, you need but ask. Until next time, folks, don't forget to jab your finger in the direction of that follow or subscribe button to catch these episodes as they go live. For one of the largest collections of free Agile templates, including lots of retrospectives, head over to www.thevirtualagilecoach.co.uk. As always, folks, don't stop believing, and thank you, Andre. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone.